Ida B. And her plans to maximize fun, avoid disaster, and possibly save the world. Chapter two. On my way out of the house, I grabbed a pencil and enough paper to make four good drawings and one mistake. And in my right pants pocket, I stuffed some strings to tie the sticks together for the rafts I build and send down the brook with notes attached to them saying things like, what is life like in Canada? Please respond. Ida B. Applewood, P.O. Box 42, Lonson's Grove, Wisconsin, 55500. Or, if this raft reaches the ocean, will you please let us know? Thank you very much. Applewood Raft Construction Company, P.O. Box 42, Lonson's Grove, Wisconsin, 55500. <laughs> it's my belief that the brook ends up at one of these two places, but I haven't heard anything back yet to prove that. The best I've gotten so far is some old man from way up in Roaring Forks called up Mama and Daddy and told them I was sending out notes with my name and address on them, and they might want to discourage that. And a teacher from Myers Falls, which is the next town over, got a hold of one of my notes and made her whole class find out things about Canada. Boring things, like there are 32 million people and some of Canada's main exports are timber and aluminum. And they sent all those facts and figures to me in an envelope. Mama made me write back a thank you note. So I drew a picture of Canadian Mountie holding the Queen of England in his arms, and they're going over Niagara Falls in a wooden barrel, waving aluminum maple leaves, just screaming with glee. Thank you very much for the information, I wrote. Let's all hope they're having some fun in Canada, too. Yours truly, Ida B. Applewood. So I had my string, my paper, Daddy's dog, and three pieces of bubble gum so I could blow a bubble as big as my face while being careful to keep it away from Rufus. Because that last time he got near one of those, we were cutting pink gum out of his fur for about a month after. And I headed out to the apple orchard. Hello, Blua. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Pastel, I said, which are some of the names I'd given all those trees. All of the apple trees were full of blossoms, and when you stood right in the middle of them you could smell their prettiness but not so much should bother you i was already sitting down under henry the, henry the eighth getting to work on a drawing i'd started the day before it was the orchard after harvest with bushels of apples under all the trees there were mama and daddy and me lulu the cat and rufus each sitting in our own tree eating slices of apple pie I was working on Rufus, who had a mix of slobber and crumbs all over him. Lulu was giving him a look of the utmost revulsion, when I realized that not one of those trees had said anything back to me. Now, some people might stop me right there and say, I to be, you could wait for an eternity and a day, and you're not going to hear one of those trees telling you, talking to you, let alone a brook. Trees don't have mouths. And they don't speak, and you might want to take yourself to the doctors and get some very thorough checkup real soon. And after I took a minute to give my patience and forbearance a chance to recover my mouth from the rudeness that it was itching to jump out of it, I would just say this. There's more than one way to tell each other things, and there's more than one way to listen, too. And if you've never heard trees telling you something, then I'd say, you don't really know how to listen just yet. But I'd be happy to give you a few pointers sometime. So I gave those trees another chance to reply and hollered, I said, hello, everybody. Didn't you hear me? But instead of the usual chorus of highs and hey there's, only Viola said, how are you doing today, Ida B? I'm just fine on such a getting to perfect day, I said. What's the matter with everybody? Why are you all so quiet? But they all stayed silent, even the loud ones, especially the rude ones. Hey, what's going on, I yelled. Finally, I heard Gertrude, Gertrude, Gertrude <laughs> whisper. You tell her, Viola. All right. Viola whispered back very discreetly. Viola hemmed and hawed for a bit, though. Well, she started, and, hmm, ah, uh, mm, she tried again until she finally got something out. 
Ida B., how's everything going at home? How's your fam? But before she could finish, that punk, Polly T., was interrupting. We heard a rumor that something bad's headed your way, Ida B., and if trees could grin like a jack-o'-lantern with bad intentions, that's what Polly, Polly T. would have been doing right then. And who told you that, Polly T., I asked, because I didn't trust him with a thimble full of water, let alone the truth. I'm not revealing my sources, he said. Did you hear something, Viola? How about you, Beatrice, or is it Polly T. just talking out of his branches? Ida B., don't pay him any mind, Viola told me. We heard something on the wind about a storm headed your way, and we were all settling in and hoping you were okay, too. That's all. There's no storm coming today, I said. Can't you feel how beautiful it is? You take care of yourself now, Ida B., said Viola. And then they all just stood there, like they were sleeping, standing up. Well, I got tired of feeling like I was alone in that particular crowd, and I was peeved about Polly T's pleasure at my expense. All right, then. I'm headed off to have some fun elsewhere, I said, and none of them said a word back. Once Rufus and I got to the brook, I asked right off, Did you hear something about me and some trouble? Did you bring the rafts? Are you ready to play? Get him ready. Get him in so we can play, Ida B., said the brook, ignoring my question. In a minute. First, I want to know if you heard something about my trouble heading my way. Oh, my, my. And will you look at that, the brook replied. I'm late for an appointment. Ida B., gotta go, gotta go. Better talk to the old tree, the brook went on as it rolled away. Yep, yep, that's a good idea. It called as it tumbled over the rocks and around the mountain and was gone. Now, by that time, I'd just about lost my patience with the bunch of them. But talking to the old tree was a good piece of advice, so I didn't mind the brook's rudeness so much. Rufus and I hiked up the mountain, which isn't really a mountain, but a hill. It's just too tiny a word for it, till we got to the old tree that has no leaves and hardly any bark. That tree is bare and white, and people think it's dead, but it's not. It's just older than old. It hardly ever speaks, and even if it does, you often have to wait a while. But when it does, you want to listen, because it's also wiser than wise. And it always tells the truth, unlike some of the young trees that tell you what they think you want to hear, or are just too clever. When we got in front of the old tree, I said, There's a rumor around that I'm in for some trouble. Now that's from Polly T., and you and I both know that his word's worth is about two fake pennies. But I was wondering if there was something I need to know. Then I climbed up into the tree's branches, and Rufus settled down at the bottom of the trunk. I rested my head on one of the limbs, closed my eyes, and got ready to listen with my insides, because that's what you have to do with this particular tree. I was sitting there for quite a while, and minding, not minding a bit. The branches against my face, warm and smooth, and it still felt like nothing could go wrong day. I was ready to believe that Polly T had just been working his mischief, when all of a sudden I got a cold feeling inside of me, and I saw a dark cloud at the front of my closed eyes, and I got a message, but not in words. That's how trees, that's how that tree lets you know things. Those things you got in your heart, then they find their way up to your head, and once they get there, they turn into words. At least, that's how I think it works. So, if I had to give it words, this is what I'd say the tree was telling me. Hard times are coming. Well, my eyes flipped open so I wouldn't have had to look at the darkness anymore. I jumped out of the tree, almost landing on Rufus, the saliva factory, <laughs> because I felt like I'd gotten a shock right through me. What? I asked. What did you tell me? But the old tree is slow to speak, and it doesn't repeat itself. It just stood there, like those apple trees had before. Are you telling me Polly T is right? Is trouble heading my way? But I knew I wouldn't hear anything back, and on a day like that, with the sun shining, four hours till dinner, and seven more items on my list of fun stuff to do, I did the only sensible thing. I decided that the old tree might not be thinking as well as it had a few years ago, agreeing with Polly T was a sure sign that something was wrong, but I wanted to be respectful and not say anything insulting. Well, thanks for helping me out, I yelled as I started running down the hill, over the brook, 
through the orchard, and all the way home. I finished my drawings in my room, safe and out of the way, just in case a storm did blow through. Except for a dinner that included lima beans and Brussels sprouts, nothing bad had happened that night or the next day. We did have a storm with thunder and lightning a couple of days later. It was a wild ruckus outside with leaves and branches blowing by and Lulu hiding under the bed to try to pretend she wasn't scared, just curious about those dust balls. And that, I believed, was all that those trees were talking about. No need, I figured, to bother my head about it again.